On the morning of April 15th, 1912, around 2.15am, the end had come for the RMS Titanic. As passengers and crew struggled around the base of the number one funnel to free and fill the collapsible lifeboats, the ship took a dive down by the head, and a wave rushed up the boat deck. Suddenly, the desperate crowd was presented with a fresh misery. The forward funnel, the height of a six-story building, came crashing down. We all know what Titanic's funnels look like, and vaguely what they did. But what were they made of, and why did they come crashing down? Today, we'll analyse the funnels, how they were made, and some of the forces at play that might have caused them to collapse. We'll attempt to answer the question, what made Titanic's funnels fall? A ship's funnels are arguably the vessel's most identifiable feature, and this was especially true of ships during Titanic's era when they were each painted proudly in house colours. In the early days of steam, ships carried one or two small boilers to generate steam, so only a single chimney-styled smokestack was required. But as vessels grew in size and complexity, the number of horsepower required to move each ship increased, and so did the number of boilers. As such, an increased number of funnels was necessary to vent smoke and hot gases out of the ship. Simple enough. Early liners carried one, two, or three funnels. But it was the Norddeutsche Lloyd liner, Kaiser Wilhelm de Glosser, which broke size and speed records in 1897, and introduced the four-funneled liner to the world. Suddenly, the number of funnels became intrinsically linked to the size, safety, and speed of the ship underneath, and British merchant companies took note. In 1907, Lusitania was introduced with four massive funnels, and the White Star Line knew they had no choice but to compete. The Olympic class, including the Titanic, would boast four enormous funnels. But what exactly is a funnel, and how did Titanics operate? The Titanics funnels, as seen from the outside, were, forgive the pun, just the tip of the iceberg. The entire structure was complex and ran deep into the bowels of the ship. Let's take a look using this work in progress cutaway of the Titanic I'm working on for the 109th anniversary of the sinking in April this year. The story begins down here in the boiler rooms, where coal is burned to boil water and generate huge amounts of steam. The steam is vented under pressure into the engines, but the excess smoke from the burning coal has nowhere to go. This is where the uptakes come in. Boiler uptakes were elaborate branch structures made of riveted sheet metal. Each branch connected to a boiler's smoke box and received soot, smoke and gases directly from the boiler's furnaces. A complex structure of internal baffle plates channeled the smoke by creating draft and ensuring it was heading with force in the same direction at all times. The uptakes, it cannot be stressed enough, were huge and so was the amount of smoke pouring through them. An equally huge chimney would be needed to carry the smoke out of the ship. Here is where the first funnel structure comes into play. The lower funnel, spanning the top of the uptakes to the top of the boiler casings above the boat deck. The lower funnels were fairly complex in their own right, but suffice it to say they acted as a flue and were split on the inside into sections to ensure optimum draft even if one of the connected boiler rooms was non-operational at the time. The lower funnels would have been extremely hot to the touch. The gases being vented through reached about 315 degrees Celsius. So they were encased for their entire height by boiler casings which shielded public spaces from the heat. Connected to the top of this is the structure we all know and love, the funnel. Each of these was some 60 odd feet tall. In fact, to account for the ship's shear, that is the amount of sag amidships, each funnel was a slightly different height, the tallest being numbers 2 and 3. This structure is actually far more complex than it looks, because if the funnel was built single walled, anybody unfortunate enough to touch it could be burnt. Remember, 315 degrees Celsius. As such, the funnel was a double-walled structure made of riveted metal plates up to about a half inch thick. Extremely thin metal, strengthened with double riveted angle bar frames internally. The inner structure of the funnel was connected directly to the lower funnel and took in the gases being vented from them and the uptakes. It was spaced apart from the outer structure by metal plates to ensure that the exterior of the funnel would not run hot. The very tops of the funnels were braced with three stiffening rods to retain shape. A quick disclaimer here. This description applies to Titanic's first three funnels. The fourth was similar but was not connected to any boilers. Instead, it acted as a ventilator for the machinery spaces, lavatories and hospital, with fan-forced air providing a flue for the galley and the first-class smoking room fireplace as well. The funnels were connected to the ship's decks by two means. First, the very bottom of the outer funnel featured a flange which was riveted directly to the boiler casings above the boat deck. Then there were the shrouds. Galvanised steel wire rope, one and a quarter inch wide, connected to the funnels along the lower stiffening band with shackles. Believe it or not, when under steam, the funnels would actually lengthen in height, again due to the heat, 315 degrees Celsius. 
so there had to be allowance for the strain. As such, thick hemp rope, a lanyard, was woven around the shroud cables and attached to pad eyes on the deck. This way, the tension could be controlled, and before lighting the boilers on departure, the shrouds would actually be slackened by the crew. Phew, we got through it. So now we know what the funnels were made out of and how they functioned. But why did the numbers 1 and 2 funnels seem to collapse when they came into contact with water on the night of the sinking? At about 2.15am, all kinds of chaos had broken loose on the roof of the officer's quarters. First Officer Lightholder had just resurfaced after being pinned against the fiddly grates as the ship sank, and the collapsible boats, A and B, had been floated off the deck by what was described as a wave sweeping up the boat deck, caused by the ship taking a noticeable downwards plunge by the head as her empty spaces filled with water. What happened next is the source of some debate. First Officer Lightholder, struggling in the water nearby, gave this account. The terrific strain of bringing the after end of that huge hull clear out of the water caused the expansion joint abaft number one funnel to open up. The fact that the two wire stays to this funnel on the after part led over and abaft the expansion joint threw on them an extraordinary strain, eventually carrying away the port wire guy to be followed almost immediately by the starboard one. Instantly, the port one parted, the funnel started to fall, but the fact that the starboard one held a moment or two longer gave this huge structure a pull over to that side of the ship. The question has to be asked though, was the parting of the shrouds a cause or a symptom of the funnel collapse? Titanic shrouds were designed to withstand a huge amount of strain. On the transatlantic run, heavy seas and rolling waves could cause a ship to roll and list either side, 5, 10, 15 or 20 degrees. This type of experience was commonplace, and ship design had to take this into account. It's worth remembering that Olympic, throughout her entire career in rough seas and storms, never lost a funnel. And it's hard to imagine that Harland and Wolfe designed the funnels in such a way that the parting of one or two shrouds could possibly cause an entire collapse. Instead, there's one key piece of testimony from the inquiries that gives us a more likely culprit. At the British inquiry into the disaster, naval architect Edward Wilding, who helped design the ship, gave his opinion when he said, the funnels are carried from the casings in the way of the comparatively light upper decks, that is the boat deck and A deck. When these decks became submerged and the water got inside the house, the water would rise outside much faster than inside and the excessive pressure on the comparatively light casings, which are not made to take a pressure of that kind, would cause the casing to collapse, would take the seating from under the funnel, and bring the funnel down. Water pressure is capable of terrifying things, as anybody familiar with the effects of Delta P can testify. One foot of water pressure equates to roughly three kilopascals, or less than half a pound per square inch. But as water rushed up the base of the funnels as they began to sink, the pressure increased exponentially. At 10 feet, the funnel's base would have been under 30.6 kilopascals or 4.4 pounds per square inch of pressure. And the casings down on A deck would now be under some considerable pressure at 92 kilopascals, that is 13 pounds per square inch of pressure. It's not impossible to think that water pressure began to buckle the base of Titanic's forward funnels, and that as the structure began to fail, excess pressure on the shrouds caused them to snap. To those outside in the water, it would have looked as if the shrouds parted, causing the funnel to fall when really, it was the other way around. The funnel began to fall, and the shrouds started snapping. The aft aspect of the funnel totally failed and broke fairly cleanly. We can tell this because there are still remnants attached to the wreck today. The band of rivets around the base of the funnel probably failed under intense strain, and the whole structure likely detached cleanly from the sinking ship. Another clue to Wilding's water pressure hypothesis is the fate of funnels 3 and 4, which remained attached comfortably, high and dry, despite a ridiculous 20 or 30 degree angle downward, and the same list to port that the other funnels endured. These funnels only detached during the breakup, when the forces of gravity became too much for the structures to endure. Whatever the cause of the funnel collapse, the effect must have been terrifying to those struggling in the water at the time. We know that the funnels crushed dozens of people swimming in the water, and there are even accounts of people being sucked back into the ship by the void left by the fallen smokestacks. It's almost too terrible to think about. Thank you so much for watching. Do you disagree with some of the points that I made, or do you have your own hypothesis? Please leave a comment and let me know. Let's talk about it. If you like my content, please subscribe. I'm going to be aiming to put out more videos focusing on famous ship designs and some of the machinery that powered them. If you have any suggestions for topics, let me know. As always, stay happy, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time.